Good afternoon. My name is Rick Mikesell, and I am the operations manager here at Trouts. And I'm here today to walk folks through a few gear guides for the approaching warm water season. As we get into the spring, the warm water species here in Colorado are going to get active, and they're a ton of fun to go out and chase with the fly rod. And they provide a really unique opportunity that's close to home, that's technical and challenging, and can put some really big fish on the board. So it's a, it's a fun time for me, and I think it's a fun time for a lot of anglers who are looking for new things to go chase with the fly rod. So in these gear guides, we'll talk through some of the necessary equipment to effectively chase these species, um, a few of the conditional circumstances you need to consider, and some small things you may need that you don't necessarily think about as you're chasing things beyond trout here in Colorado in the springtime. So for today's gear guide, we're gonna talk about bass, particularly largemouth and smallmouth. And while some of this gear and some of the techniques I'll discuss are Colorado specific, uh, we do have a little bit more of a technical bass fishery than a lot of other places in the country. They will work across the board, across the country. And a lot of the cues that I've taken for my fly fishing come directly from conventional finesse fishing for bass. And in a state like Colorado or anywhere where we have highly pressured waters and a limited resource, um, there's not as many bass here as there are in other states. This really technical approach will definitely up your catch count. As ice disappears and fish are allowed to kind of free roam in our reservoirs and the Denver South Platte River, um, the bass fishing can essentially start immediately. While they are a warm water species and do prefer warm water temperatures for the most active presentations and the most active action, the fish need to eat and they'll eat year round. And if we go with small and subtle finesse presentations, we can catch them as soon as the ice comes off all the way through the summertime into the fall. <music> to get started, the most important piece of gear we need to talk about is rods and reels. And from a fish fighting standpoint, the size of the rod isn't super important. Uh, bass like to jump and thrash and leap and they have really explosive eats, but you're never gonna see backing. They're not gonna pull super, super hard. Um, we are primarily fishing seven and eight weights. And here in Colorado, I found seven to be the ideal weight. And the reason for that seven weight is mostly throwing big flies and then lifting bass out of heavy cover. With these finesse style presentations, we will be fishing a lot of structure. And if you need to horse a large bass out of a stick pile or a log jam, having the backbone in the rod to do so is beneficial. We'll also be throwing some pretty big flies, especially as we get into later in the summer. So having the ability to turn those over without a bunch of extra false casts or extra work is important. So as we break down rods, uh, I'm going to show you options at different price points, kind of a good, better, best approach. So you can find some type of tackle solution to go out and chase these fish without breaking the bank. Or if you like really nice things like I do, I'll show you some nice stuff as well. So to start out with rods and reels, um, some will, will approach as a package, some will approach a la carte. Uh, we'll also throw lines in this section as well because that is part of this package. The absolute least expensive way that I feel you can go out and do this effectively, and this rod is actually a good solution for carp as we talk about that in future episodes, uh, this is the Reddington Field Kit. It's $389 for a rod, reel, and fly line rigged up and ready to go with backing. The Field Kit for bass, it actually says bass on it, uh, comes in a nine foot seven weight, which as I noted is the ideal size. Um, it's a stiff butt section with a little bit softer tip. That softer tip helps you open up your loop a little bit. Uh, I know it's counterintuitive watching beautiful fly casters with tight loops. When we're throwing these big flies, a little bit of an open loop helps you from fouling up and turn over the larger flies. The warm water quick shooter line that comes spooled on this is a really aggressive forward taper. And as we talk about lines moving forward, that really aggressive forward taper is important because we need a lot of energy built up to turn over these heavy, large flies. Um, in the finesse world, 
some of the flies may be pretty small as compared to what you would generally think for bass, but they're still very heavy. They need to get down on the substrate and be worked. So we need some backbone to turn those flies over. While the Reddington Field Kit is a good choice, it still leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of responsiveness, in terms of accuracy, in terms of fit and finish, but it definitely gets the job done. It's reasonably priced and it does come with a warranty. Uh, we will find in the bass world with all of the structure we'll be fishing around, the hard sets, there is some rod breakage that can happen, particularly if you're not the absolute best caster and you tend to hit the blank with your large flies. Uh, breakage does happen. So I would definitely recommend buying something with a warranty because as you approach warm water species, your rod breakage count will go up. Kind of in the better world for rod, um, let's talk about the TFO Axiom 2. Uh, the Axiom 2X is also a good choice if you want a saltwater crossover or you prefer a little bit stiffer rod. TFO has been in the game for quite some time and they're really well known for making high quality rods overseas at a good price. And while you may sacrifice a little bit of the latest and greatest in blank technology and some fit and finish, they're really high quality fishing rods. I've been really impressed since we brought TFO in at how good they fish for the money. So the Axiom 2 is 339 so just the rod is the price of that kit that we just looked at um, but this is a really high quality design and a really thoughtful design it's got a very stiff butt section and a nice soft tip to keep those open loops like we talked about it's a decent quality cork it's got this really nice composite cork in the back and on the tip uh, which is a nice aesthetic finish there is a carbon fiber insert in the reel seat to reduce weight it's a little heavier than you'd see in your premium rods, but it's a lot lighter than the inexpensive rods like the Reddington Field Kit. The Axiom 2 and the Axiom 2X are an awesome rod for the guy that has nicer rods but wants to round out their quiver for new adventures with something that's not quite as expensive. They fish close to almost as good as the premium stuff, and the fit and finish is pretty darn good. Um, it's a great way to try new stuff without breaking the bank. On to reels for kind of that middle better category. This is the Orvis Hydros 4. The Hydros is a machined aluminum bar stock reel from Orvis with a fully sealed drag. Uh, its price point is a little bit lower than other Orvis and competitor offerings because it is manufactured overseas, but it's a lot of reel for the money, particularly that it's machined bar stock and steel, a sealed carbon drag. It's heavier than some of the more premium options. In this bass world, everything's going to be heavy. If you are concerned about arm fatigue, it may be worth considering something on the higher end of the spectrum just to save weight. But for occasional use and for huck and big flies, the weight doesn't really matter. As far as the drag makeup, in bass specifically, there's a lot of thrashing and head shaking and jumping. There's not a lot of long runs. So the drag isn't super important as far as what the total torque is or how smooth it is. You're not gonna use the drag a ton in the bass world. That said, if you do want to move into carp or wiper or things that do engage the drag with the same setup, this reel will do that really well. And being fully sealed, you don't have to worry about maintenance or gunk or junk getting inside of it. In urban fishing, we are in the elements. There's lots of riprap and concrete and dirty stuff that can get inside your reel. And the last thing you want to do is lose a trophy fish because your reel seized up because something got into it. So being fully sealed, you don't have to worry about that. So this is a great middle of the road, high value, will work for a bunch of different applications, not super expensive reel offering. Now for those that really like the nice stuff and want the best of the best for everything, this is my personal bass, carp, wiper, um, lots of things set up. This is the Orvis Helios 3D with an Able SDF reel on it. Helios 3D, the distance rating means that it's quite a bit stiffer in the butt section to generate line speed and power. It's got a ton of lifting power, a ton of power to turn over heavy flies, but a soft enough tip that it still can create open loops. 
It's one of the lightest rods we carry, so arm fatigue isn't an issue. It's insanely accurate. And as we talk about sight fishing, as we move on, um, being able to pinpoint a fly and put it in front of a feeding fish is really important. It's beautifully made, fit and finish is top notch. It's priced accordingly, but it's a really nice rod for this application. Um, paired, I also have the Able SDF Reel. The SDF Reel is no questions asked, no arguments. It is the nicest freshwater fly reel you can buy on the market right now. It's fully sealed, carbon drag. The drag has a ton of stopping power. It's insanely smooth. The machining and fit and finish is next level. Um, I beat the crap out of my gear. This reel has been thrown on rock piles. It's been dropped off bridges. It's smashed against car doors. Uh, the reason that I like Able Reels is because I can put them to the test and I know they're going to bounce back every single time. I don't have to send them back for repair often, uh, especially with the way that I use them. You can see all the road rash, um, all the use patina on that. Um, I don't care that this is a really expensive reel. reel. It's a tool and I'm going to use it as a tool and it can take that beating. So if you want to go best of the best, the Orvis Helios 3D and the SDS is a great way to go. I'm sorry, SDF. So on that note, let's talk a little bit about fly lines. Most cases, 90% of your bass fishing, a floating line is adequate. We'll be doing finesse jigging in structure. We'll be ripping bait fish. We'll be working poppers as the weather warms up a little bit. Um, a floating line will do 90% of this with very high results. The one consideration that you need to make when you're choosing a floating line though is taper. You want a very aggressive forward taper, something that has lots of mass in the front to turn over heavy flies. From Scientific Anglers, uh, I brought over the MPX, which is a great all around line that still has a heavy forward taper. If you're gonna be using this for more applications, things like carp, uh, potential colder saltwater like stripers, freshwater stripers, anything that you don't need a sinking line for. The MPX is a really great line choice. It does a ton of things and it does it well. This is the amplitude as well. So it's very durable, it shoots to the guides with amazing ease. It picks up off the water really smoothly. Uh, it's a very high performance fly line that does a lot of different things. If you're looking for something that's just specific to a bass setup, the SA Bass Bug is a good choice. And this is a much more aggressive forward taper and a heavier head. This is designed specifically for turning over big flies, big wind resistant flies like poppers and gurglers, uh, heavy jigs. It's gonna turn them over with ease. It's gonna save your shoulders. It's a little too aggressive for carp. It's gonna be splashy. So I wouldn't choose it if you're gonna use a seven weight as a carp rod as well. But if you're just doing bass, this line's tough to beat. And the last line that we need to talk about, and this will pay dividends if you do move into uh, more pelagic bass species, temperate bass species like wiper and white bass, but also it's really important for stillwater smallmouth is a full intermediate. The intermediate is a one and a half to two inch per second line. When you're fishing deeper water to suspended fish, this gives you the ability to control that sink and know where you're getting. It also gives you the ability to do some cool stuff with top water. In specific still water scenarios, large reservoirs with smallmouth um, and wiper and white bass, there are times when fish will sit off dam or riprap structure and aggressively eat top water presentations. And while the traditional popper or pop and bug works great, something walked the dog or with a really erratic action is even better and fish really respond to it. So with a sinking line, essentially you can pull the nose of the fly down into the water column and with controlled twitches and strips of your rod tip, get it to jerk back and forth and walk the dog like a wounded bait fish or something injured. And smallmouth in particular really respond to this. There are also times in larger reservoirs where fish are suspended or locked to structure that's deeper that you can get down to with the sink of your fly alone. So having an intermediate line allows you to have some controlled sink. It's slow enough that you can fish skinnier water with it without hanging up all the time, but it's quick enough that you can effectively fish up to about six, seven feet with a controlled countdown and repeat that pattern. So you're touching that every single cast and getting down to where the fish are. So I 
choose my line based on where I'm fishing. If I'm fishing a larger reservoir where I know I'm gonna be targeting different depths, I'll probably bring two rods, one with an intermediate, one with a floating line. If I'm just walking a local pond or fishing the Denver South Platte, it's a floating line every time. So what do we attach to our fly line? Let's talk a little bit about terminal tackle, leader and tippet. The good news about largemouth and smallmouth bass is it's not very complicated. You really only need one size, maybe two sizes of leader and tippet. In most cases, I'm fishing 16 or 20 pound leader and tippet. Uh, 20 pound is great for flies that are really expensive, flies that I don't wanna lose, heavy lifting applications, lots of brush and structure. The downside of 20 pound is it's almost impossible for you as a human to break. If you do snag on something and you need to get that fly off, you're not gonna go take a swim board or try to save it. You really can't break 20 pound off. So in most cases, if I'm okay with losing some flies, if they get snagged on structure, I'm fishing 16. It's heavy enough to lift fish out of structure. It's abrasion resistant enough to um, not get beat up as it drags over the top of things. But if I need to break a fly off, I can break it off on 16. Length of leader is fairly counter to what you're thinking in the trout world. We're fishing really short leaders. This is the Scientific Angler's Absolute Streamer. It's a four foot leader. It's really short and it's really aggressive. That super aggressive, thick butt section transfers energy really nice, getting these big flies to turn over. And bass are not leader and tippet shy. So you don't need to have a long leader to keep them from spooking. It's way more about presentation and getting it in the zone. So the short leader, uh, gives you a lot of advantage in casting. Off the end of that, I'll attach, depending on what I'm using, 16 or 20 pound tippet. In most cases, I'm using jigged or finesse style presentation, so I'm fishing fluorocarbon because it sinks quickly and it's really abrasion resistant. If you wanna fish poppers and topwater on fluorocarbon tippet alone, it's not a big deal, you can do that. It may cause a little bit of sink and put a little bit of weirdness in the action. Um, if you're a really diehard topwater popper fisherman, you probably want to fish a heavy mono as your tippet, but fluorocarbon is more abrasion resistant. It sinks quicker. Uh, it's just better properties all around. So if you're just going to buy one spool, 16 pound fluorocarbon is the way to go. And this SA Supreme tippet is by far the best fluorocarbon on the market. With the AST plus coating on the outside, it's crazy abrasion resistant. If you need to pick up quickly and get it off the water surface, it's gonna break surface area tension. It's durable. Uh, I was fishing the Denver South Platte two days ago and fishing this tippet and I missed a hook set and got my flies lodged into a tree. I was able to pull down a branch about that thick to retrieve my flies without anything breaking because this stuff just had so much power and strength to it. So if you haven't messed around with the new SA fluorocarbons, uh, they're pretty special. They're super strong tippets. So let's talk about a few other things that you're going to need to go effectively catch bass. First and foremost, and probably the most exciting part of this whole game is flies. And bass flies are just cool. They're big, they're flashy, they have a lot of features. A lot of bass flies these days are essentially designed to mimic what conventional anglers are doing with lures and soft plastics. And it's pretty exciting to see how creative fly tires have adapted that to fly materials. So the first couple patterns we're gonna talk about are finesse jig style flies. And while water temps are still cold, this is probably going to be the meat of your fly offering. So if all else fails for bass, for carp, for trout, for so many warm water species, the one fly that does everything well is a woolly bugger. And this is a tungsten jigged woolly bugger. It's got a super heavy overweighted tungsten bead and a big hook gap, a nice strong stiff wire hook. In the early spring when fish are slow and their metabolism is slow, they will respond to subtly presented small meals more so than they will to big meals. So something this tiny, I know it seems strange for bass, can be a super effective bass pattern for both largemouth and smallmouth. And slow jigging action around structure, letting it drop, letting it flutter, popping it back up, letting it drop, letting it flutter. Uh, it's a killer action for bass around structure. This thing, if nothing else is working, the tungsten jigged woolly bugger 
is a great choice. On to bass worms. So anyone who's conventional fish knows about the Senko, the plastic worm. It's the most deadly, probably widely used bass bait out there. And some creative fly tires have made flies that mimic that action and that presentation. Um, these are a couple of jigging style worms from Umqua Feather Merchants and Rainies. They both feature these long tails. And the way a Senko or worm soft plastic works is there's a heavy weight in the head and when you pause, the worm tail sticks up and wiggles subtly. And when you strip or retrieve, it pops up, rises, flutters back down and wiggles. And a lot of times you'll get the eat on the wiggle. So this long chenille tail or this long bunny strip tail, when the fly drops, will just stay up here and float and wiggle. And this one even has a foam pad glued onto the end. So it really is nice and buoyant and it will just stay up and wiggle. There are weed guards on both of these patterns. If you're fishing in heavy cover with lots of weeds in the summer, uh, I'd leave them on. If you're not fishing in heavy cover, I'd probably cut them off because sometimes they can foul up on a hook set and you may miss a fish. Really large one-aught, two-aught hooks. The trick with bass mouths is because they're so big and the way that they engulf a fly, if you have too tiny of a hook and you set, you may miss the catch. So a lot of these bass flies are gonna have huge one-aught, two-aught, three-aught hooks to catch the side of the mouth when they set on it. If you watch underwater footage of bass eating flies, it's really cool. Their mouths are so big, they don't necessarily nip or catch the edge of the fly. Essentially stationary, mouth comes open, entire fly is engulfed, completely disappears. You don't get a ton of feedback from the entire mouth engulfing the fly. It's not like something caught and pulled back. All you're getting feedback on is the lips touching the tippet as it goes through. So you're setting on very subtle eats and you need that big hook when you set as they open back up to catch the corner of the mouth and get them hooked well and land them. And bass jump a ton, so they're really good at spitting hooks. So big, deep penetrating wide gap hooks are important to keeping bass stuck. As temperature warms up, their metabolism increases, they're gonna get more active, they're gonna start being willing to chase down bigger meals. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is crayfish. This is Eller's Grim Reaper. This is one of my favorite crayfish jigging style patterns. Again, super big wide gap hook, uh, long point for deep penetration. It's got a rattle in it. Bass respond to noise a lot. So having something with movement um, and lateral line triggering vibration is important. A ton of rubber legs that just flutter when it's paused. And when it's stripped, this big paddle tail pushes a lot of water. Bass are feeding a lot on lateral line sensation on vibration and movement that comes through the water. So having flies that move water, that push water, that create a lot of vibration are super important. So this Eller's Grim Reaper is an awesome crayfish or just general jig imitation. Next up is bait fish. Um, Trout, or I'm sorry, bass like to eat bait fish and as water warms, they'll chase bait fish down and it can be really exciting. A few bait fish that I chose, it's the classic, the chartreuse and white clouser. Um, again, next to the tungsten jig woolly bugger, this is probably one of the second most versatile warm water flies. Catches anything that eats bait fish. It's proven, it's been around forever. It's got great action, it's a proper sink. Pretty tough to beat a chartreuse and white clouser. If you wanna get a little bit more technical, the Mojo Minnow is built on the Clouser platform, but it has some more realistic features. This one mimics a yellow perch really well. In a lot of our fisheries, yellow perch are a prime bait fish. Solely based on impressionistic and movement features alone, this is the, Crafts Mojo, uh, the Craft Minnow, the CK Minnow. It's got a bunch of different names, different companies have tied it, um, but you can just call it a Craft Minnow. It's got this nice chenille wrap bait fish fur head that pushes water and kind of flutters as it moves. And this wiggly soft foam tail that has a ton of action as you strip. This is a very buoyant fly. So if you are going to fish it subsurface, you either need to fish it on a sinking line or some type of weight ahead of it. But the movement in the water to this is second to none and it really gets a lot of fish interested. The last and probably most classically noted fly type are poppers and gurglers. While it's an effective way to catch bass in a lot of places and probably the most fun way to catch bass, 
here in Colorado, it's pretty rare that you get a meaningful topwater bite. Usually it's at low light periods, early mornings, late evenings, or on those warm days where we get lots of frontal activity where it's still fairly warm, but it's rainy, it's cloudy, it's kind of crappy out. That's when bass tend to put down their guard and be willing to break the surface to eat. Gurgler style patterns are probably the most effective. They're the least cool aesthetically, but they're more subtle than a true popper. They're going to dive and push water and just hang out in the surface film. And fish that aren't willing to completely come up and break the surface will be more likely to take a gurgler than they would a true popper. We talked about the walk the dog action. Uh, this is the Rainey's Femme Fatale. This has a little um, bill on it and it has a wedge head and it has this big paddle tail. If you drop your tip in the water and work this, it'll work like a walk the dog bait. It'll pause and twitch and shudder and stop. And bass, like all predators, they like prey that's easy to catch and a wounded bait fish is easier to catch than a healthy bait fish. So this is really gonna mimic those erratic actions of a wounded bait fish. And then the true classic, the, the bass popper, the bass bug, the popping bug. Um, when you strip this, it throws bubbles, it throws a ton of noise, it looks like a frog or a wounded bait fish. It makes a ton of action, a ton of noise, and when bass eat these things, it's explosive. It's like a toilet bowl flushing. So on those really prime summer days when it's overcast or crummy, pull out a popper and have a ton of fun. It doesn't happen a ton here in Colorado, but it's really fun when it does. What do you want to keep them in? I really like these Uncle waterproof bug lockers. Um, as I've gone through all the fly boxes over the year with silicone and foam and all kinds of different storage options, the good old fashioned drop them in a Plano with lots of organization has kind of come back into my favor. I like the ability to be able to transfer them in and out of boxes quickly, not have to fight the foam or the silicone pulling them in and out. And this Umqua waterproof bug locker is waterproof. So if I wade too deep or if it falls out of the boat when I'm fishing out of a boat, I don't have to worry about all my flies getting ruined. Couple locks and it's nice and waterproof. So the last few peripheral things that we need to talk about are just the accessories that we need to sea fish, land fish, carry our stuff around, all the stuff that's kind of complementary to the gear we just discussed. Uh, the first thing we need to talk about is a bag to carry all this stuff in. This is the Orvis Bug Out Backpack. This is my personal choice for a great way to carry all this gear and be comfortable and ha have it get in the way. The thing I love the most about this backpack is this side entry portal. I can take these big boat boxes and slide them in here, get into them quickly in and out without taking the backpack off. I can just turn it around on my shoulder and get into it. It's got a ton of storage. Uh, it'll hold four Plano style big boat boxes in the main compartment. It will hold one in this top compartment. And then it has a ton of other storage for leader, tippet, accessories, sunglasses, whatever you need. The really cool thing about this bag is this unique rod carrier. If you wanna carry a tube, rather than having it stick up way up here as you're walking through the airport, it has this sleeve down below that you can feed through and the rod tube is gonna be level with the backpack and sit nicely on your shoulders and not snag things overhead. What I use this for most often is when I'm carrying two rods. If I have a sinking line and a floating line and I need to carry the sinking line rod, or when I'm fishing conventional and fly at the same time, I can stick my bait caster in here and this holds the butt section and the bait casting reel actually sits right there and I can walk around with my bait caster, switch around as I decide different tactics are necessary. Um, this is by far the best rod carrier in a backpack I've seen to date. It also has a net sleeve, which is unique on this that a lot of backpacks don't have. So I can keep my net stored out of the way in the back and have my net handy. A lot of folks don't think about nets in bass fishing, um, but here in Colorado, particularly with a fly, I'm a big proponent of a net. You'll see in the bass videos, the guys do the boat lift where they'll just lift the fish over the edge of the boat and drop it in. Fly rods aren't designed to do that. If you're to lift a heavy bass, you're probably gonna break the tip. So having a net to land the bass safely is critical. You can't just horse them up onto the bank. It's not great for the fish to drag them onto the dirt anyway. So a good landing net, um, always a big fan of the rising nets, super durable, uh, impossible to break, big bags, hold all kinds of fish, 
can't really beat those. Of course, you'll need basic tool. Um, the rising, either the ultralight or any of the rising two-in-one scissor and hemo combos are great. You don't necessarily need uh, nippers, just you're cutting big stuff, you're dealing with big flies. Having a pair of pliers to get big hooks out of mouths, something to cut heavy line, um, and the ability to kind of stay away from teeth if you use these in pike applications and things like that is important. So as far as tools are concerned, all you really need is a good pair of pliers with a cutter. While a fancy pair of nippers or a nice nipper cuts line nicely, we're using heavy lines. We don't need anything super precise. So the ability just to cut heavy line, to pull hooks out of hard mouths, to pull complicated knots tight, um, the butt section of this works great as a knot tightener. Just to make sure that you're getting all that beefy stuff nice and snug and keeping your fingers safe, the rising ultralights are a great setup for that. The last thing to talk about, and one that not a lot of people think about, is high quality polarized sunglasses. Um, here in Colorado, we have really good sight fishing opportunities for bass. Because we are in a higher elevation, we have clear waters, we can see bass, we can present to them, and we can watch them eat. So having the ability to see through the glare, see where fish are sitting, to present to them well, the sight fishing aspect is something that's really cool here that a lot of other states with more murky water don't have. Watching a bass eat, watching those gills flare in that giant mouth and gulf of fly is super cool. So don't do yourself a disservice and not be able to see that happen or see where fish are sitting. Uh, for all fishing, it's important to have a high quality pair of polarized sunglasses. Here in the shop, most of us are using Bahios. Bahio is an American company in Daytona Beach, Florida. They make super high quality glass and polycarbonate lenses, and they're a fishing first company. So all of their lens design, their lens color, their fits are for anglers to maximize their time on the water. So it's not a cool looking pair of sunglasses, although they, are, they do look pretty cool. It's focused on helping you catch more fish, which I like a lot. Thanks so much for watching this video. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day to learn about new species on the fly. If you have any questions about bass or carp or pike or any other angling opportunities, give us a shout via phone or email. We love talking about this stuff and we hope you'll join us for future videos on pike and carp coming shortly. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Give us that, hit that button, smash that button. <laughs> <laughs>